everybody back to day three of conclave the last day of uh, conclave um, for uh, Reverend Deacon Jonathan Stewart's presentation on the return of the divine feminine in the modern age. Jonathan Stewart is a Montreal based writer and editor originally from Canada's east coast but secretly from Alberta. He grew <laughs> up on Prince Edward Island and attended university in Halifax and moved to La Belle province in 2006. After four years of writing nine to five in the corporate environment, he's now working in the terrifying land of freelance and still can't speak French. He has had a long passion for all things Gnostic, esoteric, and mystical. And some of this started with him reading Philip K. Dick when he was 12 and moving straight on to the Nag Hammadi Library when he was way too young to understand any of it. He came across the AJC in 2011 and has been in love with the welcoming and supportive Jonahite community ever since. He joined the church in 2013 and was admitted to minor orders in 2014. The subdiaconate in 2018 and ordained at the diaconate in, in 2019. And I'm confident that uh, should he continue to pump out papers, that the priesthood is entirely possible in 2022 and 2023. And I'm immortalizing that in the recording. So he will do exactly that. Because uh, uh, Canada needs more priests, eh? So let's call that a boot. <laughs> Um, so with that, I will turn it over to the Reverend Deacon Jonathan Stewart to talk about the return of the divine feminine in the modern age. Take it away, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Your Eminence. And, uh, you know, the great thing about this topic and about my speech today is I can recycle all the research for seminary papers. So <laughs> it's a win-win situation. Uh, and actually talking about the return of the divine feminine in the modern age, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today and uh, inshallah, uh, God and patriarch and future conclave organizers willing that uh, this will actually be the, the first part of probably a three part series, because uh, we're the, depending on how you define maternity in the modern age, we're really going to be talking about the 19th century today and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but I think I have enough for three uh, 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 lectures or talks on the topic. So the 19th century, the 20th century in the 21st century. So let's, uh, let's talk a, a little bit about uh, what I'm going to talk about today, which is the return of the divine feminine. I was inspired to do this topic and in the way that I'm doing it by uh, Ronald Hutton in his book, Triumph of the Moon. Uh, I highly recommend reading this book. You should read Ronald Hutton. Everybody go out and read Ronald Hutton and read Triumph of the Moon. But um, he sort of has a reputation, which I think is unfounded as something of a debunker. So he, he writes a, a lot about the history of witchcraft in the West, about the history of the religion of Wicca, the modern religion of Wicca, uh, about the esoteric in the West. And he, he presents uh, the scholarly data that, that some of the, the traditional histories um, that these traditions are on broken and ancient, that there's an underground goddess worshiping witch cult uh, seem to be 20th century creations. That said, I, I find that he's, he's very generous. And he, uh, the debunker label is, is not necessarily fair because he's always quick to connect these ideas in the ways that they are ancient um, and inspired by ancient materials. He's always quick to uh, present uh, these modern goddess and magical religions as serious religions and how they can be serious religions. And he's uh, always generous with his summations of their ideas. So he, in his book, talks about how there's almost an inbreaking of the goddess uh, that starts to intensify in the 19th century. And this is him being generous to, to believers, people who aren't scholars, where all of a sudden there seems to be uh, a, a lot of societal interest and influence uh, in all sorts of different quarters and all sorts of different sectors about goddesses and the divine feminine. And if you're looking at this, uh, you know, theologically, uh, he generously says, well, 
you know, maybe this is maybe this is this female divine trying to properly break into history. So so that really inspired me. Um, so we're going to look at sort of 10 different in breakings that are more or less in the 19th century. Uh, this may seem a bit disparate that and I am going to be jumping around from country to country, from era to era. And this is very broad, very general. And I know I'm talking about a lot of different cultures, a lot of different countries, a lot of different uh, decades. So uh, even, and I'm going roughly chronologically, but there'll be some jumping around. This may seem disparate, but I think that these are 10 important in breakings that uh, are influential in surprising ways right up into the modern day that might have connections with each other that may not be apparent on the surface. And um, this will culminate in the revelation, the revealing of uh, perhaps secret isn't the right word, but a forgotten, a veiled, uh, God is worshiping religion at the end of the 19th century, one that's not talked about much today, that's even as this topic is becoming popular in scholarly circles, is not really discussed. So a forgotten, veiled, but influential, uh, secretish goddess religion at the end of the 1800s. Um, and just to emphasize when I talk about divine feminine goddess spirituality, you know, this is one of the most uh, important religious developments of the 20th century, right? And bleeding into the 21st century. If you are uh, interested at all in religion, in uh, as a practitioner or as a scholar or as both, you have to tackle uh, the late 20th century interest in uh, goddess religion in the divine feminine, uh, particularly, you know, starting in the late 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Um, this is uh, this is a huge important uh, movement, uh, and of course, uh, for modern Gnostics with our uh, uh, ancient traditions uh, about divine feminine figures, uh, that particularly important. Um, one last thing before I finally actually start, um, which is uh, sometimes talking about the divine feminine, talking about a divine figure, the definition of a goddess. I I'm thinking of uh, uh, Dr. Litva, who's been on uh, talk gnosis, where his uh, scholarly work is really around theosis and becoming divine and uh, humans becoming divine figures, where how we define a god is uh, often uh, really culturally biased. Uh, because of this huge focus on monotheism in the West. So if you were sort of uh, an independent scholar uh, who didn't know anything about Christianity, you know, you would study this religion and okay, maybe internally they don't call angels gods, but this is a, a divine being that uh, uh, doesn't have a body, that can do miracles, that descends to earth, that can be uh, prayed to, that uh, can be looked at as, a, as an intermediary, you know, particularly in if you think about Catholicism, but also lots of different forms of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have uh, uh, angels as, as uh, intermediary figures, right? Or the Trinity or the Virgin Mary. If you were looking at these from the outside, uh, you would say, well, these, these are divine figures. Okay, now internally, this religion might have some distinctions, but as far as I can tell, these are gods. And this is how we, you know, kind of treat other religions. So keep keep that in mind when we're sort of talking about the divine feminine divine figures. Um, we're going to start at the end of the 1800s. So influential idea number one, because it has to be tackled, but we're not going to spend too much time with it, which is scholars started to believe across Europe that there was a, a primal, primeval uh, cult of the goddess, and that this was a monotheistic goddess or a at least uh, part of a, a duo but uh, uh, a very important deity and that later 
goddesses were uh, reflections or misrememberings or guises of this primal goddess. Uh, now, this idea, uh, you can still uh, hear it today, often in sort of New Age and, and religious sectors, but it's, it's really fallen out of favor in scholarly circles, and it has for a long time. And, you know, this, again, we're, you're going to hear me say this a lot because I love saying it. There's a whole lecture right there. But we're just going to start there because I think you can see why that is an important and influential idea if we're talking about across the West uh, uh, tackling ideas about the divine feminine. Okay, number two, I tricked you. I said we're so we're going to talk about the modern age, um, but we're going to go back a little bit to the 17th century to the 1600s. That's right, this is the first lecture of the day, so you have no excuse to fall asleep uh, unless you're in Australia. In that case, camera on, I'm watching you. Uh, this, this is uh, a future topic that I would love to do a conclave because sort of one of the secret influential figures of the Western esoteric tradition uh, is um, uh, Shabbatay Zevi. Uh, uh, 1626 to 1676. Uh, he was a, uh, a Jewish uh, uh, Kabbalistic uh, philosopher, uh, religious thinker uh, from um, uh, modern day Turkey in the Ottoman Empire, who declared himself the Messiah and had a, uh, what I think perhaps to, to modern ears and to the years of people at the time was a very heretical interpretation uh, of Kabbalistic Judaism. So uh, with Sevi, he, um, he had uh, announced that he was the Messiah and this was the coming of the Messianic age and that the Jewish people would be restored, uh, that uh, Israel would be restored. Um, but in his system, in his Kabbalistic system, because the Messianic age had come, uh, things were being flipped on their heads. So the old rules that were in Judaism no longer applied because those were for the age before the coming of the Messiah. So he would do things where uh, he would publicly break you know, some of the important rules of Judaism. So he in public would uh, 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 say the forbidden name of God. Uh, I don't know, he would have a ham sandwich. Uh, he uh, uh, married a sex worker, um, echoing both the, the prophet of Hosea in uh, the Bible, but uh, also some other Gnostic and Kabbalistic figures. But we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, he publicly also uh, married the Torah. Uh, he um, uh, broke the Sabbath. So, and he's also accused, and his followers are accused of um, um, uh, the, the lots of sex things. And some of that seems to be true. So when, when we come to the sex stuff, the uh, it, it's a common uh, trope when you're kind of talking about heretical religions that you don't like, that they do a whole bunch of freaky sex stuff. So maybe the freaky sex stuff with Sevi and his followers is over-exaggerated, but it somewhat seems to be true. And there's sort of two things behind the freaky sex stuff. One is this, this flaunting of the rules, the breaking of the rules, the rules no longer apply, okay? Um, and the in his Kabbalistic system, there's a lot of symbolism about male and female polarities of the divine. The divine is a unity that has uh, a sort of fractal uh, 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 relationship of emanations and some of those are coded male and some of those are coded female uh, and that this gets expressed in very um, uh, sexual language um, so there, there seems to be sort of a, a living out of um, the uh, uh, the symbolism uh, what's all this have to do with the divine feminine we, we are getting there uh, first is both this idea of casting off the old rules, but also because it's a messianic age, there, there was a strong political message, which is now there's extreme equality. There's going to be extreme equality within the Jewish communities, but also the entire earth because the Messiah has come. It's going to be the reign of, of God on earth. So that got people thinking, you know, that the Messiah is here now. Uh, so equality starts. Well, how do we make equality right here in our communities? And, you know, people looked around and it, uh, it seemed that women 
women were unequal, right? So within Zevi's community, uh, women uh, gain a lot of uh, power, respect, uh, treated as equals. Um, and of course, this becomes a feedback loop, right? Because as when when you notice that uh, women can be leaders and women can be spiritual, the leaders can uh, spiritual leaders who have insights and capitalistic insights, it also makes you uh, reflect upon the nature of the divine being that uh, these women are in touch with and channeling and uh, leaders of communities in. Uh, and of course, since we already have this capitalistic uh, symbolism where we're talking about some of the, the female nature of God, you uh uh you have a, even more of a framework so this equality but also ideas about the female aspects of god become very important uh one of the most important is sort of a sophianic idea that uh the the female nature of god uh has a sort of descended fallen sophia akamov aspect which they called the shekinah um, and they really did use sort of Kabbalah as many people out there would recognize it in the hermetic communities. So this would be Malkuth on the, uh, the tree of life. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, just Google uh, tree of life uh, Kabbalah. And this is uh, 10 Sephiroth, 10 emanated aspects of the divine, which are fractally uh, reflected in all creation, and again, are balanced uh, between male and female pairs. Some of them are coded as male, some of them are coded as female. There's an idea of a higher female and then a descended female, which is sort of trapped here in earth, um, trapped here in matter. Uh, and part of Zevi's um, mission is to actually redeem this aspect of the divine, uh, which is trapped here in earth. Um, trapped within our own souls, and uh, part of the way that it's redeemed is is through through actions, uh, as well as meditations, as well as rituals. Um, and Zevi and his followers also emphasized the onfallen, the higher aspects of the female divine, and would address prayers to God's wife and God's mother. Um, finally, coming back to the freaky sex stuff, um, Zevi believed that. Um, that to properly have the messianic age and to bring universal reconciliation to uh, uh, fix the the hole that was in the divine, that the because the world was was fallen and broken, that the fallen Shekinah actually had to penetrate as into every aspect of the universe, including its darkest corners. Okay, and actually one of the reasons that reconciliation hadn't happened, that uh, that the whole universe didn't come back together again, that the messianic age hasn't come, is because this is a slow and brutal process. And that the Messiah actually has to descend with the Shekinah, and that previous messianic figures, including Adam, including the prophets of the Bible, only went so far and weren't able to go all the way down with the Shekinah into the darkness. Um, the darkness that's guarded by a uh, multi-headed dragon being, uh, which, which is very demiurgic. Um, this actually pops up a couple hundred years later in uh, the symbolism of the Golden Dawn, which is very interesting, but we'll, we'll get to that later. So doing some of the freaky sex stuff or breaking some of these uh, important rules within Judaism was uh, seen as going into this darkness into uh, descending. So this is another reason why. So we have a couple different reasons why to break the rules. Uh, so I hope I'm making sense. Uh, that's a tough thing with uh, with these lectures on Zoom, right? No feedback. Actually, I should have um, I should have uh, said that if people have questions or comments, they can they can jump in there. Um, oh yes, and uh, His Grace says, and don't forget a Muslim co uh, convert. Uh, we'll we'll definitely uh, cover that, Your Grace, because uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're. We're, we're almost there. So, uh, so this idea of, 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 of doing these, these dark actions, going to these dark places, doing all this stuff is uh, accompanying the Shekinah, bringing the Shekinah into every, every inch, into every 
human experience uh, in, in every place. So uh, Zevi is uh, traveling all around. Uh, he basically, uh, he lives all around uh, from, from Cairo to Jerusalem. Uh, he's usually run out of town, but he's getting a very big movement and authorities are, are getting quite worried about this because there's also, of course, political ramifications when you declare yourself the Messiah. He decides to go to Istanbul, to Constantinople, uh, which is the, the seat of the Ottoman Empire at the time that the Ottoman Empire is probably at its height. So one of the uh, great empires in world history. Um, and uh, one of his followers, his sort of prophet, Nathan, uh, unfortunately says that when he arrives in uh, Constantinople, that the Sultan will take the crown off of his head and place it upon Sabbatee Zevi's head. Uh, that, that seems to get back to the Sultan. Uh, Zevi is brought to court and he's given three options, uh, which is um, one, he can prove his divinity. Uh, that his divine status of Messiah by facing uh, a, uh, a row of archers who will unleash uh, arrows. And if they all miss him, then, then he's the Messiah. So option number one. Uh, option number two, he can be impaled, you know, while alive, just you know, kind of uh, oh, like, you know, big, big spike, sort of lowered down on it very slowly and painfully. Or third option, he can convert to Islam. So uh, Zevi's given a knife to think about this. And uh, wouldn't you know, but God comes to him and tells him to convert to Islam. And this is viewed by many of his followers as a, as a capitalistic act. Uh, again, kind of breaking the rules to bring uh, 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 light into every corner of the universe, to accompany the Shekinah into every corner of the universe. Uh, and uh, he, he starts actually, he tells some people, he tells some of his followers that actually this is a trick that he's um, converted to Islam to, to bring, you know, the, the, the rest of the Semitic peoples of the world into Kabbalistic Judaism. And then he tells the Sultan, actually, you know what, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm telling people this, but this is actually a trick because I'm trying to bring the Jewish people into Islam. And uh, for a while, he's, uh, he, he's treated fairly well at court um, uh, and he's giving, uh, given a pension. And then, he, you know, he gets up to shenanigans, like I just mentioned, and he's banished, but still has his followers. So I know we're only on number two, uh, but, uh leading up to Zevi after Zevi we have uh Jacob Frank Jacob Frank uh 1726 to 1791 who saw himself as a reincarnation of Zevi he was uh Polish but he was a merchant who traveled around uh, uh throughout the Ottoman Empire throughout uh, Europe and uh made connections with uh the the Frankist communities that were left after Frank's death and he believed that he was uh the reincarnation of Zevi as I said and a messianic figure and a divine figure perhaps uh the incarnation uh, of the logos um and uh Jacob Frank is really interesting because uh, kind of the same thing, right? He travels around, he gets kicked out of places, uh, kind of like uh, uh, Zevi. He has a, a lot of powerful friends, a lot of uh, uh, money kind of flows in. And uh, kind of like Zevi, uh, 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 he didn't convert to uh, Islam, but he actually converts to Christianity. Uh, and he's, he's baptized, I believe, by the king of Poland himself. And this also kind of makes him a, a celebrity because uh, I'm not sure that a lot of the Christians knew what his teachings were and i'm assuming that he is actually kind of literally saying things in a different language to his followers but he convinced a lot of his followers to quote unquote convert to christianity but really he was saying just like zevi that this is a, a cabalistic uh action that the just as uh you know zevi married a sex worker uh we have to marry uh this debased religion of of christianity uh just like zevi became a, a muslim to redeem uh uh secretly redeem the muslims we have to become christians to secretly redeem christianity but actually here's here's the inner teachings and here's inner cabalistic teachings and also maybe i'm jesus Jesus. And um, he, uh, he he seemed less interested in Jesus than in the Virgin Mary. So he's, again, a very important influence uh, throughout Europe on ideas about the divine feminine, because he believes that the Virgin Mary is an incarnation of the Shekinah, of the Sophianic figure. Uh, and he really uh, has a bunch of Kabbalistic inner teachings about the Virgin, and the Virgin becomes very important in, in his cosmology. Um, uh, Jacob Frank also taught that to redeem all of humanity, since humanity was understood to be, you know, male and female, that there needs to be a male and female uh, uh, messiah. So uh, uh, Jacob Frank obviously is the male messiah, and his daughter uh, Eve Frank is the female messiah. So 
can see where we're going with this. This is one of the, the few uh, Jewish women in history to be acclaimed as a uh, female uh, messiah. Uh, she does seem to have understood herself and her followers and her father understood her as sort of a divine figure as the Shekinah incarnated as Sophia incarnated. Um, she lived 1754 to 1816 again she uh, she sort of moved in royal circles, uh, she started off having a lot of money from her many followers. But she didn't seem to excite people the same as her father did, and uh, not a lot of new people came into the movement. And as the movement aged, you know, the top organizers either died or stepped down, and they weren't really able to keep the movement going. And she wasn't able to keep herself in in wealth. But she was uh, an important figure who was really known right across Europe. And again, kind of like her father, controversial, uh, and a lot of people uh, would go and like visit her and talk to her, and you know. Uh, try to understand her philosophy and Kabbalah and self-understanding, if not uh, for their own spiritual um, edification, but uh, at least as, as a curiosity. So we're finally moving on from these very interesting uh, uh, heretical Kabbalistic Jews. The, now, why are they so important? Uh, one reason is, is that, uh, particularly for Zebi, uh, yes, that's right, thank you, Will. Um, uh, they, um, uh, uh, um, like Zebi's movement was very, very big, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, went across the Ottoman Empire to all across Europe. And then even people who didn't like Zebi sort of got whipped up into a messianic fervor. The important thing about uh, Zebi as well is this particular branch of Kabbalah really gets uh, sort of uh, spread all around Europe. And this becomes even more important with uh, with Jacob Frank. So uh, both uh, as his followers uh, uh, both lead the movement or stay in the movement and join other movements, they spread Kabbalah around Europe. And uh, the sort of the reason why these uh, folks are so important is they they really are the ones who inform our modern use of Kabbalah, who really in many ways give Kabbalah to uh, future groups at the end of the 1800s, like the the Order of the Golden Dawn or the Marginists or what have you, uh, because uh, which we're going to get to next. A lot of these uh, Frankist Kabbalistic Jews uh, become Freemasons uh, and they become Rosicrucians. So. Um, so with this particular Kabbalistic focus on the divine feminine, they really disseminated around Europe in, uh, in very literal ways by having a female messiah and in uh, sort of uh, more uh, under the uh, 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 surface uh, influential ways. Um, so number three, the, uh, the Rosicrucians of the, of the 1800s. So I mentioned that, um, uh, and if you don't know who the Rosicrucians are, we don't have time to kind of get into the tradition, but mystical Christianity uh, influenced, not a separate religion, uh, you know, meat and lodges, um, uh, lots of crossovers with uh, Freemasonry. Um, so they already have um, teachings about the divine feminine figures and uh, about Sophia. And as I said, uh, the, the Frankish Kabbalists come in with their ideas as well about divine uh, feminine figures. They join a lot of these organizations. Uh, with the Rosicrucians, uh, a lot of them were interested in alchemy. And uh, for a long time in alchemy, there's an idea that uh, the divine essence that's in matter it can be purified and brought out and this is how you create an alchemical uh tincture or medicine or how you create the philosopher's stone and i'm simplifying quite a bit and that this divine essence was symbolized by uh by a maiden and by sophia and was called sophia and of course you can then if you're talking about inner alchemy you're applying the symbolism of alchemy to spiritual practices bringing forth sophia within oneself so here we have you know sophianic divine Gnostic style uh, reflections already moving through. Um, as well, we already have that, but a lot of the uh, uh, Rosicrucians this time are reading uh, Yaakov Burma, and uh, His Grace did a, a lecture on Yaakov Burma, which you can watch on um, the, uh, the uh, AJC YouTube channel or listen to it in the form of the lectern. Uh, and for Burma, uh, he's influenced both by alchemy, but also his own visions and also some other readings on the divine feminine. Uh, and for him, uh, Sophia is uh, a very important role. Uh, the Virgin Mary sort of synchronized to the Sophia. So 
Rosicrucians, there's another important thing. Uh, number four, even though maybe this should be number one, is the Romantic movement. Um, the Romantic movement is, uh, how would you define it? It's, uh, it? It touches basically all aspects of life throughout Europe, particularly in Germany, particularly in England, but basically the uh, all across Europe and all across the uh, the world, and it's uh, 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 reaches into philosophy, into art, into literature, into just about everything. So ideas about uh, goddesses, divine feminine, was dramatically altered by that complex of cultural changes known loosely and conventionally as a romantic movement. One aspect to this was the exaltation of the natural and irrational qualities that conventionally had been both feared or disparaged and characterized as feminine. Cultural historians have devoted many works to tracing the course of this revolution in taste, which for the first time gave emphasis to the beauty and some limiting of the wild nature of the night. So the term uh, eternal feminine, which, you know, we're kind of getting into some, some similar terms here, was first popularized by the romantic writer Goethe. Uh, he mentioned the term in the second part of his tragic play Faust, um, and people uh, have long looked at Faust as a, as a Gnostic metaphor. Um, and, and embraces this philosophical view of the female depicting uh, women as pure, delicate, celestial, and immutable. Um, a spoiler alert for the end of Faust, if you haven't read it, uh, the, the, the Faust uh, the sells his soul uh, to, uh, to a demonic figure, um, but he does it for knowledge, so it's okay, and he does it for love, so it's okay. But basically, he, instead of going to hell, is actually saved by a, a procession of uh, divine feminine figures. Uh, saved by Sophianic figures, saved by wisdom. So uh, when he dies, uh, the, the matter Gloriosa, the glorious mother appears, who seems to be the Virgin Mary, but is also uh, talked about uh, deliberately with uh, languages from the ancient world to describe Isis. So he's kind of synchronizing her to uh, uh, other great mothers, to other uh, divine figures. Um, and then three famous women from the Bible uh, show up to argue with the with the great virgin that he should be allowed into heaven. And then finally, his lover, his symbolic allegorical lover, Gretchen, appears, uh, and all these divine figures together uh, grant him uh, redemption. So uh, all of the transient is parable only. The insufficient here grows to reality. The indescribable here is done. Woman eternal beckons us on. Um, we also have a great appreciation in the Romantic era of um, uh, uh, Greek myths um, that, that really become um, uh, back into style in a huge way. Uh, understood uh, both allegorically and uh, and as inspirations for many works of art. So you have lots of plays and paintings. And of course, if you have Greek myths, you're going to have lots of divine female figures, right? Uh, fairy tales. Now, I know this might seem strange to you, but, you, you know, until the Romantic era, uh, the fairy tales were, were looked upon as, um, you know, dumb stories for kids that, uh, that didn't have anything of use. And then actually fairy tales would probably be more important and have a more elevated status in the Romantic era, because there's this idea of uh, fairy tales as sort of the, the folk traditions of the nation, of uh, important uh, legends legends and stories of the people that contain so much of their heritage and perhaps uh, uh, the, the remains of their ancient gods, for all we know. So fairy tales become uh, collected, uh, they become codified, they become quite popular, they become told to, to children uh, in sort of an organized fashion, you know, instead of just being, you know, you know uh, uh, now you have hundreds of, of fairy tales for children instead of whatever the local ones that your mom or, or wet nurse knew. Uh, why am I rambling about fairy tales so much? Well, we have all these divine figures, right? Going back to my definition of what a divine figure is, but uh, uh, we're everybody from witches to lots of female heroes to queens. So this is getting getting into people's heads, right? And it's also showing up in art quite a bit. Uh, uh, Keats, Shelley, uh, Rossetti, who is both a painter
major and a poet, uh, Robert Browning, they uh, used the Greek goddesses as well as basically their own creations where they, this is where we're really getting sort of a, as a placeholder idea of a goddess that represents all the other goddesses as well as nature. Uh, this really becomes big in the romantic movement. Although they are drawing on medieval sources that sort of that either use the goddess Venus or just a sort of a generic goddess as, uh, as a symbolic allegorical figure, not really as a religious figure. Here, they're taking that allegorical figure to the next level and things are starting to get religious, right? As Rossetti says, a sacred goddess, mother earth, thou from whose immortal bosom God and men and beasts have birth, uh, leaf and blade, bud and blossom. Uh, the myth of Persephone becomes really important uh, and pops up in all sorts of different places. Uh, uh, Marcus uh, K. Louis wrote a whole book about it called Persephone Rises. And uh, she says, in this case, uh, was Persephone was translated as a fascination of deep and hidden forces within the individual psyche and cultures, giving rise to the symbol of a life-giving and appalling underworld. As a cor corollary, the undermining of the religious faith led to new questions and approaches to death and resurrection, while at the same time as another result of societal change, as the alteration in the position of women led to fresh views on marriage, rape, and mother-daughter relationships. How are we doing here? Okay, I'm going to speed through a couple. Uh, spent too much time talking about uh, Shabbat Sevi and uh, Jacob Frank and Eva Frank, uh, the female messiah, but they're just so fascinating. Um, here's an exciting one, uh, which I really think you can draw a straight line. Uh, but you're going to have to wait to part two or part three in future years, inshallah, that uh, going to, you know, the pagany new age um, uh, uh, goddess ideas of the present day. But uh, in the 19th century, we, we really had the beginning of a new Marian age in the Catholic world and within the Catholic church. So kind of starting in the mid 1800s, uh, stretching all the way up to basically World War II. So we have uh, a, a series of visions around the world in all sorts of different uh, situations and all sorts of different people start seeing Mary. We have uh, a new interest in Marian devotions. We have art, we have more poetry, and we start to have talk of a early medieval idea which uh, has uh, gone up and down in uh, popularity, uh, often seems to be pushed uh, both by uh, very conservative people, but also very mystical people. It's often associated with the Francis Franciscans, which is the idea of the Virgin Mary as a co-redeemer with uh, Jesus Christ. Now, again, I, I don't have to talk about how this is an obvious elevation uh, in her divine status even higher. Um, and, but really emphasizing the idea of co-redeemer without making it quite uh, official uh, uh, church uh, um, um, a doctrine. So the popes and the encyclicals starting in the mid 1800s start dancing around and using some language similar to co-redeemer and start getting the people who are very interested in this idea quite excited. So that is circulating around the world. Uh, and also in Anglicanism, you have the Oxford movement, which was basically kind of bringing in more high church and Catholic style traditions, which brings back uh, the saints in a big way, including female saints. Okay, number six, uh, uh, spiritualism. So uh, uh, seances and spirit, uh, 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 speaking to the dead, uh, becomes a, a huge trend and religious movement in the mid 1800s. And it's particularly associated with women. Uh, women seem to be easily become leaders in this movement, uh, respected religious leaders, uh, respected for their mediumship and insight. For uh, uh, many reasons, uh, it, it's believed that women are natural mediums, uh, that they can uh, easily uh, access uh, this, the spirit world. Um, and society seems to be able to create a space for a variety of women, including many working class women, to set themselves up as uh, uh, leaders uh, and as mediums. And not just, you know, your loved one misses you, but uh, channeling religious insights from the spirit world. So spiritism sort of has even now a bad reputation, partly because of its association of women, actually, to be honest, but also because some of these mediums were later shown to be frauds. Uh, but that said, the religious dimensions of this movement are often um, uh, misunderstood and underplayed. So it wasn't just, you know, talking to the dead to, to see, to have reconciliation between the 
the dead and the living. They believed, uh, uh, many of them believed that the, the spirit world was dynamic and that after you died, you actually uh, kept evolving uh, through the spirit world uh, to higher and higher levels, uh, as well as spirits were, um, the spirits of the dead, you know, a very ancient idea coming back, were, were intermediaries between uh, uh, lower and higher. Uh, that is basically they could connect you to to God, um, and it would often be sort of combined in very interesting ways with Christianity, right? So becoming uh, uh, a very bizarre version of Christianity uh, that also includes reincarnation, that includes you know people channeling things, uh, and it becomes a religion and is still a religion. Uh, like there, there's a spiritist church uh, here in Montreal, so it, uh, so people you know have uh, church buildings get together sing hymns uh have a have a sermon uh and of course uh someone will perform as the the medium and uh channel and then sometimes there's a healing circus uh sorry healing circle that was that was not uh, a freudian slip um the other thing with spiritism uh is uh, uh so like at its peak you know you're talking almost eight to ten million people around the world as well as just people who uh, have some contact with it who find it interesting who've gone to a seance but it, it becomes uh very intimately connected with uh progressive causes so uh women's suffrage uh, uh the end of slavery uh the uh there's actually a, a lot of contact apparently from the other side from the spirit world that they that they wanted women to have the vote and they wanted uh slavery to end um and, and it basically if you did sort of a word association at that time the words uh, suffragette and spiritualist would go hand in hand. So very intimately connected with, with pro progressive causes. Now we're about halfway through and something that we don't really have time for me to talk about, we can talk about afterwards, but I think you're picking up on, and you know, some of the points I'm sort of hinting at is that the, the liberalization of the West in the 1800s, the beginning of democracies in some countries or the more democratic uh, elements and the rise of women's rights is also intimately connected with how people think about religion, about the roles of women in religion and the nature of God uh, in connection to having uh, uh, feminine uh, qualities or feminine identity, right? But this is very complex and it seems to be an interplay of the two. Um, it, one doesn't, automatically always lead to the other but sometimes it does and sometimes one causes reflections in causing the other to evolve so keeping all that in mind um i'm gonna uh, i'm running low on time uh be, so i'm gonna kind of run through some of the some of the next ones before i get to the, uh, the hidden church of the goddess at the end of the 1800s. Uh, the Celtic revival, there's a growing sense of Celtic identity, both in the diaspora and in the Celtic countries, which uh, uh, were looked down upon by their English rulers, right? So the, there wasn't a, a lot of national pride. There wasn't a lot of uh, pride about culture, about traditional stories and practices in the Celtic countries until this revival, which is also influenced by romanticism. And uh, there's a big influx and interest in stories from uh, the Celtic past dealing with the, the gods and goddesses of the ancient Celtic lands, the legends, the folk tales. So you have this dissemination of uh, goddess-like figures and a great interest in them. Uh, and that becomes quite important later because there's uh, ideas which again are, are debatable uh, about a, a triple goddess, uh, one goddess who's uh, understood as a, as a maiden a uh, uh, a wife and a and a crone uh, who represents both the moon and statuses of uh, uh, of uh, life and uh, all sorts of other things. So uh, people see this as a important feature of uh, ancient Celtic religion and this idea of a triple goddess uh, who perhaps uh, sometimes might be presented as three separate goddesses and sometimes as one uh, gets moved around. Uh, number eight, theosophy, very important. So theosophy is actually founded by a woman, uh, by uh, uh, Blavatsky in 1875. Blavatsky is a very interesting woman. She travels all around the world. Uh, she sort of synthesizes a uh, esoteric system from uh, uh, teachings from both the West and the East and her own insights and visions. Uh, she claims to be in touch with uh, hidden masters uh, who are, are humans in some way, but uh, also supernatural 
Marshall and many others who come to her with, with some of these teachings, um, uh, a great emphasis on the uh, teachings of the East, but uh, there's also uh, a big mix. Uh, and there's actually a lot of pushback within the Theosophical Society to bring more uh, Western esotericism in. Uh, Blavatsky always claimed that, it, that it's not a separate religion. Theosophists said it then, so they say it now. Uh, those many people would sort of sign up for theosophy as, as their main spiritual path. Some, you know, stayed in and explored other spiritual paths. Um, theosophy is probably the most influential thing to happen in Western religion since the Protestant Reformation. It's incredibly influential. A lot of ideas that we think of uh, as New Age now uh, come from theosophy, but as well as a variety of ideas. They're very interested in the Gnostics. Uh, G.R.S. Mead, uh, uh, who is uh, Blavatsky's secretary, you know, translates and uh, circulates a lot of Gnostic documents. And uh, as I said, there's sort of pockets of interest in Gnosticism and Hermeticism within the TS. So um, with the, uh, so the TS is founded by a woman uh, and uh, all of the important leaders after Blavatsky are women. Uh, again, for sort of some of those connections between alternative religion and progressive causes, uh, Anna, Anna Kingsford is the first woman to doctor in England, or at least one of the first uh, women doctors ever in England. Uh, she's particularly interested in Gnosticism and Western over Eastern. She formed the Hermetic Society and she was the head of the London branch of the Theosophical Society. She's also remembered uh, as a birth control advocate, as a suffragette, and she would probably be much better known today, uh, as well as many of the women connected to theosophy. Uh, if it wasn't for historians kind of being like, you know, this this weird stuff is freaky, um, and uh, this is what they really got into and really wrote about later in their lives. Uh, so they're sort of left out of uh, or diminished in, in the history of uh, feminism in the West. Uh, but Anna Kingsford was very important. Uh, Annie, Annie Besant, um, who uh, became the president of the Theosophical Society and actually grew the Theosophical Society to the largest that, that it was and, you know, honestly ever will be, led it to its greatest success. She definitely would have been remembered as an important suffragette uh, birth control activist. Uh, she fought for Irish and Indian independence her whole life. And she was a friend uh, uh, of the Fabian Society. She moved in all these very important circles uh, with very important thinkers. And again, she sort of came to... She was an atheist, agnostic, and then she came to uh, the theosophy and then that became her main passion. Um, so uh, in Canada, uh, Emily Stowe, uh, that is one of your, you know, taking a Canadian history course. She was one of the most uh, famous feminists of the 1900s. She's one of our first female doctors. She is the first female school principal. She was an activist for uh, vote and for the full rights. Uh, uh, Augusta uh, Gullen and Margaret Dennison, uh, also important feminists, and they were all founding members of the Canadian Theosophical Society. So again, you know, we have all these people interested in women, women's freedom who are leaders within the Theosophical Theosophical Society, and the Theosophical Society does have ideas about uh, the divine feminine. Um, one that becomes important later that's sort of minor in Blavatsky is the world mother. So the world mother synchronized with Mother Mary and Sophia and a variety of divine figures around the world and uh, Hindu goddesses. Um, there's even rituals later on. Uh, Ledbetter uh, says, the world mother then is a mighty being who is the head of a great department of the organization and government of the world. She is in truth a mighty angel having under her a host of, of, of subordinate angels who she keeps perpetually employed in the work which is especially committed to her. That work has so many and such wonderful ramifications, it's not easy to give even the most general idea of it in a few sentences. Let it suffice for the moment to say that in a re very real sense, all the women of the world are under her charge, and most especially at the time of their greatest trial when they are exercising the supreme function given to them by God and thus becoming mothers in the very deed. That's number eight. Okay, number 10, very, very quickly, just suffragettes and women's rights in general. Generally, the suffragettes were either... Um, uh, atheists, agnostics, or they're into some sort of alternate spirituality. And I know I keep hammering this point home, but I have it as number nine as a completely separate point. So Elizabeth uh, Cady Stanton, 1815 to 1902, may be a great example. Uh, in her time, probably the most famous uh, woman alive in America. Still remembered today, but uh, perhaps a little bit less than her friend and comrade, 
uh, Susan B. Anthony, who she later fell out with. Uh, and she actually fell over over religion because uh, Elizabeth Cady Stashen thought that religion should be liberatory and that Christianity could be more liberatory and that this was an important part of the struggle to create this liberation theology, uh, where uh, many of her comrades in the women's movements thought that that was just going to piss everybody off, right, and sort of mobilize people against her. But she published uh, uh, an incredibly popular book that uh, sold out of many printings and was basically 100 years at least ahead of its time called The Women's Bible, which was a uh, uh, work of scholarship that was really using all the critical historical tools at the time to examine the biblical text. And uh, within that, she, she says, the Trinity was composed of a heavenly mother, father, and son, and that prayer should be addressed to the ideal heavenly mother. Number 10, we made it, folks. And how am I doing for time? I, I have 15 minutes. I'll run through You're doing this. Pretty good. We'll have some time for questions too. Okay, fantastic. I'm I'm really happily. Oh yeah, sorry. And I, I didn't have my screen open because I was looking at my uh I was looking at my um uh notes, but uh, uh thank you, Will Mac the Conception, of course. So uh is very uh very important uh when talking about um the deification of Mary. Okay. The secret hidden church of the goddess from the end of the 1800s. Um, this is a church that, that I would say uh, movement, religious movement, that is um, the only one that I know of uh, the, in the West for at least thousands of years, if not ever, that is specifically a, uh, a movement that is recognizable as a religion, that has uh, priests and priestesses, that conceives of itself as a separate religion, that has uh, everything that we in the West uh, kind of think of as a religion. Uh, so, you know, rituals, uh, uh, the uh, doctrines, uh, holy texts, prophets, uh, the, the whole nine yards of uh, whether that is right or not, about how you should define religion has, has all of that. So, uh, um, very different from some of the other movements that I've been talking about, right? To have a, because the Theosophical Society claims it's not a religion. Um, however, if you pick up a book like the Ronald Hutton book, uh, uh, there is a lot of scholarship on goddess worship, as I said, because it's so important when you get into the 20th century, that, it, that if you pick up a scholarly book, you're not going to find any mention of this movement. But uh, even if you pick up like uh, a book by like, you know, Raveness uh, uh, Moon Sphere, uh, that, that's kind of talk about the history of the goddess, you're probably not going to find anything about this movement. So let's read uh, a statement from one of the leaders of this movement. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have the intention here of giving the full expose of the doctrines of the Gnostic Church, but there is one doc uh, dogma on which I would like to insist. It is the dogma of feminine salvation. The work of the Father has been completed, that of the Son as well, remaining as that of the Spirit, which alone can determine the definite salvation of terrestrial humanity and prepare the reconstitution of the cosmic Ad Adam Kadmon. The spirit or the paraclete, as the Cathars named it, corresponds to that which is feminine in the divinity, and our teachings specify that it is the only face of God which is truly accessible to our reason. The Hebrew language identifies the spirit as ruach, which is of the feminine gender. What exactly will be the nature of this new and next Messiah? Will it be a woman from the elite with a specific mission of working this salvation? Or will it be a group of divine women? I couldn't say, but what I do know and affirm strongly is that by the eternal feminine, that the world will be saved. That comes from uh, Fab de Arche, uh, who was the, the second patriarch of the restored Gnostic church of the 1890s. So the, the Gnostic church of the uh, fin de sil France, uh, the, the one that uh, bubbles up that we have lineages to at the end of the uh, 1800s, uh, has a great emphasis on Sophia and the feminine aspect of God. So again, if you're looking at this stuff as a scholar, uh, you have a divine goddess figure, you maybe you're not saying the word goddess, but who is incredibly important and emphasized in this system in an organized systematic doctrinal fashion. Here we have one of the most important goddess cults in the modern age. Um, 
so the Gnostic Church, specifically this Gnostic Church, there are Gnostic key churches before the, 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 the French Church at the end of the 1800s, but it's started by a man named Jules Dwinell, who was a archivist and a librarian, and for his whole life had uh, visions and uh, uh, heard voices, uh, you know, interpret that as you will, but, uh, you know, uh, divine voices. So he actually became, uh, again, going back to the importance of spiritual uh, he became interested in spiritualism because that would seem to be an organized and systematic fashion to make these connections that he was spontaneously having. So first there, but then he started, uh, he discovered uh, some Gnostic documents in uh, the archives that he worked at, and he read those, and those really inspired him, and he started uh, having visions that uh, 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 involved Gnosticism. Um, he uh, uh, so he was involved in a variety of alternative spiritualities. Uh, and uh, the quote here, in his frequent attempts at communication with spirits, he is confronted with a recurring vision of divine femininity under various aspects. He gradually developed a conviction that his destiny involved his participation in the restoration of the feminine aspect of divinity to its proper place in religion. So this was uh, a path that he was on before knowing anything about Gnosticism, and he already had a sense uh, that he had been chosen for a divine mission of restoring uh, the role of the feminine in religion in the West in general. So as he starts to become interested in Gnosticism, obviously he can see some doctrines that are making some connections. And then he starts having some visions, including one where the Aeon Christ and uh, a group of uh, Gnostic Cathar bishops actually tell him uh, that, that they're consecrating him, that uh, uh, that they, they place his hands upon him and consecrate him uh, a bishop and uh, with everything that that entails. Um, but the big one is, and I, sometimes these visions are, are mixed together, but I, I believe they are separate. Sometimes when dealing with the, the fin de sil uh, uh, French era, when you don't speak France, uh, when you don't speak French, it can be uh, a bit of a challenge. But he um, uh, is friends with a, uh, a noble woman named uh, Lady uh, uh, Kafnes, uh, Lady Marie Caithness, who is a Caithness, uh, who is a, um, a Spanish English uh, uh, nobility, uh, who also has a, a, a palatial estate in France that she spends a lot of time in. And she was uh, interested in, in spiritism in, uh, in seances, but was actually a, a direct student of Anna Kingsford and Blavatsky and uh, helped organize the Theosophical Society in France and the other places that she lived. So she was not just sort of like a kooky rich lady who is interested in seances, which is, I think, sometimes how she's remembered in the Gnostic world, was a, a serious student herself uh, of um, uh, of uh, esoteric knowledge. And she did, uh, uh, her her seances were sort of a form of automatic writing. She used a, a pendulum over a letter board. Um, so she, she actually is the channel. She channels an important message from Sophia to uh, Jules Duanel. Uh, which is a charge for him to start a Gnostic church in the year 1890. Um, and this is, this is what uh, Lady Kathniss uh, channeled from Sophia to uh, uh, Dwanel. I address myself to you because you are my friend, my servant, and the prelate of the Albigensian Sakafar's church. I have exiled from the Pleroma, the fullness, and it is I whom Valentinus named Sophia Akama. It is I whom Simon Magus named uh, Helen Ananoi. I am the eternal androgyny. Jesus is the word of God. I am the thought of God. One day I shall return to my father above, but I require assistance in this. To intercede for me, the supplications of my brother Jesus are required. Only the infinite is able to redeem the infinite, and only God is able to redeem God. Listen well, the one has brought forth the one, then one, and these fear but one, the father, the word, and the thought. Establish my Gnostic church, the demiurge will be powerless against it, receive the paraclete. Um, I think that's a good place to end. So questions, comments, uh, that's, as I said, hopefully part one of three. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that, that I, I just wasn't rambling, uh, rambling like a crazy person for for an hour. That uh, I did deliberately choose sort of ten disparate but interconnected uh, historical uh, uh, breakthroughs. This is what I like to think of. You know, I like to think of sort of that veil. You know, Sophia on the other side trying to trying to push on through. Um, so yeah.
first of all, thank you so much for for that. I mean, it, it was it certainly was ranging all over the place, but um, made a lot of connections that I certainly uh, hadn't made uh, myself. Um, I'm interested, in just one little detail that you mentioned uh, right at the very beginning, um, which is the idea of the the sort of Asiatic uh, mother goddess. Um, and you suggested that, that uh, the scholarly uh, community has has moved uh, away from this. This is new to me because I'm not I'm not up on recent scholarship there. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because that's a, a movement that I was was unaware of. Yeah, I I don't want to of course say that there's there's no Asiatic mother goddess, right? Um, but there's and, and uh, I'm also being uh, um, you know rather quick on that entry, right, as a survey. So so I didn't really go into the idea that they moved away from, which is, you know, much more of a specific end of the 1800s, beginning of the 20th century, that, that this one specific goddess from every inch of Europe and beyond where humanity was uh, represented the exact same divine figure. Right. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And, you know, modern scholarship really, you know, uh, um, kind of looks at this and says, you know, well, you know, the, we, we, when we take up some of these statues, there might be some similarities, but these, these were probably pretty different cultures. Um, and some of this comes from, um, you know, this is very interesting. And I know your grace, uh, probably something that you find very interesting, but I always finding uh, and it's, it's much more apparent in, in older scholarship, but still, I would say apparent now, um, the, these hidden Christian biases, because, you know, what, what that narrative is, is a primal monotheism, right, that then because, you know, you have this primal goddess who becomes a multitude of characters in sort of a uh, degradational way, right, um, which is which is a Christian narrative, right, you start off a monotheism uh, worldwide, every culture is originally monotheistic in some way, and then the idea degrades over time becomes heretical and you start uh, uh, having idols and different representations of, of divinity. So, uh, you know, subconsciously, these scholars are actually taking this idea and applying it to something that's very different from the Christian God. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I hadn't made that connection either. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian's got his hands up. Christian, go for it. Yeah. So, um, with <clears throat> with the title, the the return of the divi the divine feminine, uh, that of course implies the the losing of the divine feminine. And in your opinion, is is that more um, the, the reasoning of that lost? Is it more a direct oppression, uh, like or suppression of it, or is it sort of a a forgetting of it and more of a focus on on the divine masculine, I guess, in a way. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, great question. And again, for some some sort of like, and uh, uh, I disagree with modern scholars on quite a bit, actually. So the modern scholars have tried to move away from kind of suppression uh, narratives in lots of different ways. But to make a long story short, you know, that's not right. And yeah, it's mostly suppression, right? So I, I think, and, and this is, you know, perhaps uh, a whole discussion or, you know, a topic to, to talk about a conclave is, is this interlinking of ideas about God and the divine feminine and the role of women in society, right? Um, and I, I, that that connection, I, I think, sometimes it's overemphasized, sometimes it's underemphasized. But if it if it doesn't automatically uh, create, you know, perfect equality and a feminist utopia to believe in a goddess, right? Which it probably doesn't. It, at least the powers that be were scared of that, right? So there does seem to be a societal reason uh, why the divine feminine is is always pushed down. So that was a very long answer to say, yeah, oppression. <laughs> um, now, when we talk about return, you know, some of this return is mythic, right? When you, when you, when you, you know, I'm kind of dancing around or talking about some of the different movements and some of the different goddess movements that have, you know, legends about a, a primal goddess utopia. Um, so, you know, is, is that returning? What was that ever there? But if you specifically think about Gnosticism, right, and the role of the divine feminine in Gnosticism and my thesis, basically, that, that this is a very important goddess movement um, in the modern age, uh, then that's definitely a return, right? Because Gnosticism used to be around and, you know, then it disappeared for a while. 
So yeah. Why, why use five words when you can use 500? Um, Angie? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, you know, last night in the talk, we, we, the question I brought up, the question of, well, how, how do we bring the feminine into our practice? And, and so having you give this talk, I feel like really starts to bridge that, you know, not just it's not just women going, hey, let's talk about the feminine. Having um, other men also talk about it, I feel like it's really important. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, as I said, stay tuned for uh, part two and part three in years to come. And, you know, thanks for staying awake for the whole thing. See, this was the really like, obviously all the conclaves are really interesting with lots of interesting talks, but this is the one where it's like, oh, you know, it's not a lot of history. There are all these exciting ideas, right? Uh, ideas about creativity and the role of Gnosticism in the modern age. So I'm glad to have come in and ruined that with a long history spiel. We, we needed it. Thank you. Yeah. History talks are my favorite talks, and I, th I thought that was excellent. And yeah, you could definitely have a dedicated talk for for uh, you know each one of those uh, each one of those sections. So I hope you I hope you follow this up either in talk gnosis or we can dedicate some time for a, a one on one for the lector. Oh yeah, that's oh, uh, uh, Scott's got his hand raised, so go next, Scott. Uh, so to pull it back into the whole ideas and art uh, theme that we've had going throughout history, the the rebirth of the mother goddess has come through art. Yeah. And it has come a lot of times, as you were saying, through like the Romantic period and through depictions of the Virgin Mary and this Asiatic goddess. That's kind of how they came about as they found the statues. And so I think we still see that we see uh, Salvador Dali with his uh, pictures of the Madonna and the Madonna is his wife. So she's elevated to this sort of deific figure in his paintings. So uh, I don't think you've necessarily broken the, uh, the chain as it were. Um, maybe what we need to see too is some more modern Gnostic depictions, you know, not just Jules Doinel with his vision, visions, but maybe we need some art and some stories and some uh, of these sorts of things that encounter that that current within Gnosticism. What do you think of that? Uh, I, I completely agree. That, that's all I can say. Uh, so, <laughs> good idea. Let's do it. Um, but but you are right, and uh, I, I think um, the the there's so many challenges being being modern Gnostics, right? That that creating a new modern mythology is 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 yet another challenge, which I think is what what art is, right? So you know, um, myths 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 that make sense for for today. So I think sometimes it gets a little bit neglected because you know we're just always trying to understand these these very complicated ancient texts, or we're trying to find some scraps. In my case, of you know what some dead French people thought in at the end of the eighteen hundreds, right? Um, so. Uh, with so much going on, uh, I, I think sometimes we, we neglect that that mythic right here, right now focus. Uh, so I don't know if that's that's just more reflections, uh, 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 Monsignor. But <laughs> okay, okay, dokie. Well, thank you very much for that. That was that was fantastic.